Greetings to everyone! Today I am very excited to present you a teardown video of new Marantz AV8805A AV preamplifier. Just after Marantz released their AV7706 and SR8015, it became clear that an upgraded version of AV8805 will come out sometime soon. And here it is! Just before I start, I'd like to remind you that your likes and subscriptions are much appreciated. Production of these videos takes a lot of time and effort, so your support drives the growth of this channel. Great, let's see what's inside of Moran's AV8805A. I will start with the top cover, as usual. This top cover consists of three parts. First, I must undo six screws to remove the middle part. And just by the feel of this part, I can say that it's an audiophile grade product. It's made of thick sheet of steel and even the flip side is painted very neatly. And now the sides. Each side is fixed with six screws. Two at the top, three on the side, and last one at the rear. After all the screws have been removed, side cover panel can be lifted from its place without much effort. Exactly same procedure for the right hand side panel. Here we are, now all three covers have been removed. Wow, it's a very densely packed unit. Let's crack on and see what's in there. I will start with the front AC. I have to disconnect all the cables first. Here goes HDMI extension. Next goes the cable which mainly controls LED indicator lights on the front panel. That's the USB extension. And last one is the main ribbon data cable. As you can see, the ribbon cable is additionally shielded to minimize the interference between the components. I will protect the end of this cable with some electrical tape as a precautionary measure, just to eliminate possible damage from static electricity. Great, now let's undo the screws. Five at the bottom of the unit, two from each side, and five more from the top. As soon as the side clips are released, the front AC can be removed. I have to do it very slowly as all the cables are still threaded through the front chassis. And the last thing to do is to unplug the power cable which provides vacuum fluorescent display with alternating current. Ok, now let's take a closer look at the front AC. Before I start disassembling the rest, I have to remove these two solid aluminium knobs and undo the nuts which are securing the rotary potentiometers. Next, I have to cut the tape that keeps the HDMI extension cable in place. One more screw undone and I can extract the front HDMI slash USB unit. You can see an additional shield around this PCB. Again, it's done to minimize the interference between the circuitries. Next, the headphone socket can be removed. I must unplug the door switch and the volume PCB before I start unscrewing the front board. Great! 23 screws are undone. Next, I have to carefully peel off the ground bus contacts and the front PCB can be successfully extracted. On this PCB you can mainly see two vacuum fluorescent displays, dozens of micro switches and some analog circuitry for calibration microphone, headphones and auxiliary input 1. Unit control is implemented by digital PCB and this PCB is a human interface device only. Right, let's undo another three screws and extract the volume PCB. 
This PCB also houses an IR sensor for the remote control. Talking about remote control, it would be great if Marantz provided RF remote control instead of IR, but they still haven't done it. Now I will take apart what is left from the front panel. This front panel is very similar to a AV7705 front panel. It's mainly made of plastic, except the brushed aluminium cladding in the middle. Here we are, that's the whole front acid assembled. Even though the front panel is not fully made of metal, there is an inner front wall made of steel that fully shields the unit from the front. My next step will be extracting the switched mode power supply board. There are only two cables to unplug on this board. There is a power cable which fits the digital PCB and a C cable which fits the toroidal transformer. Now I can remove four screws which are securing this PCB to the rear panel and one more screw which secures it straight to the chassis. Now SMPS can be happily extracted. It's very handy that Marantz made this PCB so easy serviceable. As I mentioned earlier, SMPS fits the digital PCB and also it switches the main toroidal transformer on and off when it's needed. Next I will remove top cover braces. They are fixed with two screws each. Now that I have an unobstructed access, I can start untangling all the inner cables. Before I start unplugging them, I will attach a little tag to each of them. So later it's easier to find which cables goes where. I realize that most of the connectors are different and it's virtually impossible to mix them up. But I will attach these tags anyway. Great, now I can unplug all these inner cables without too much worry and work on HDIM ASI extraction. Hyperdynamic amplifier module ASI is fixed with three screws to the front chassis and with three more screws to the main chassis. After all these screws are undone, HDAM ASI can be removed. Now it's gonna be fun. I have to remove 15 modules and each of them is fixed with two tight screws. So I really hope you will enjoy the sight. Here we are, that's one of the 15 hyperdynamic amplifier modules. Audio signal from DAC reaches this module unbalanced and gets converted by it into a balanced one. That means that this AV preamplifier is not fully balanced, which is a bit disappointing as DAC is outputting a balanced signal. On the other hand, HDAM inside the AV7705 is regular and audio signal only gets converted into a balanced one by two operational amplifiers after it leaves hyperdynamic amplifier module. So the solution inside AV8805A is not perfect, but it's better than AV7705. Now what is left is to separate HDAM connect PCB from its base. Three screws out and it's done. 
HDAM Connect PCB is a passive port, which makes hyperdynamic amplifier module easier to service. Okay, I think it's time to extract the toroidal transformer. I have to disconnect all the cables before I do it, of course. The thickest connector goes first. After the current is rectified, it provides the HDAM with 12 volts bipolar feed. Next goes the cable which provides audio slash video unit with 7 volts bipolar feed. And the last one is 13 volts and 5 volt supply which is also feeding audio slash video unit along with XLR output relays. Now I have to grab a bit bigger screwdriver to undo 4 screws which are securing the transformer. Success! transformer is extracted. Again, size-wise it is similar with the one you can find inside the AV7705. I tried to avoid it for as long as I can, but the time has come to extract the rare panel assay. It consists of digital PCB, DAC, audio video unit and XLR input PCBs. To ensure that extraction goes smoothly, all the cables must be disconnected before I start. The ribbon cable between the audio video unit and XLR output PCBs goes first. Then goes a link between XLR output and subwoofer XLR PCBs. And last one is the cable which provides power for audio video unit. Oh, I've almost missed this tiny fella. It's an embranchment for the headphones output. Great, now it's time for another amusement. I have to undo 30 screws which are securing the XLR output connectors manually. I have to do it because XLR output PCB will stay attached to the chassis and I will extract the back panel IC. All right, now another seven screws to separate the rear panel from the chassis. Last two screws which are keeping back panel IC attached are undone and finally these parts can be separated. I will put the back panel IC aside so that I could carry on working on what is left attached to the main chassis. It means that the XLR output PCB has to be removed next. I will start with undoing screws which are securing these four transistors. And then six more screws which are securing the PCB itself. 5 volt regulator unit is unplugged and giant XLR output PCB can be extracted. This PCB consists of two parts. First part routes audio signal towards the XLR output sockets and second part is generally three linear power supplies sitting on one board. As I've mentioned earlier, one power supply provides the hyperdynamic amplifier modules with 12 volts bipolar feed. Second one provides audio video unit with 7 volts bipolar feed. And the last one is a single pole 13 and 5 volt supply which also feeds audio video unit along with XLR output relays. I will move on and finish tearing down the main chassis. 5 volt regulator which Marantz engineers placed on the separate PCB for some reason is removed next. Very thick toroidal transformer base made of aluminium is removed too. Next goes the aluminium plate which works as a heatsink for the linear power supply transistors. front chassis is now separated from the main. Four feet with very good quality wool pads are also removed. 
and now it's time to separate an additional chassis layer. Before I start, I will mark the holes with white LX tape, so it would be easier for me to return the screws into the right holes when I'll be reassembling the unit. So 12 screws are removed and the additional chassis layer is separated. And that's not all. Nine Z-shaped brackets are still attached to the chassis, but not for long. Finally, I am getting closer to the most exciting part. I will start disassembling the back panel IC by removing the phono PCB. The fact that the connection between phono PCB and audio video unit is implemented by this tiny side connection PCB is very convenient. After two screws are undone, phono PCB can be removed. It's a very simple phono stage built with JRC operational amplifier. It looks very similar to phono stage that you will find inside the AV7705. Except that AV7705 phono stage had an hyperdynamic amplifier module at built-in. Which is strange, I would expect the phono stage to be in the same class at least, or even higher. But for me personally, it's not essential to have an advanced phono stage built in, as I will use external one anyway. Subwoofer XLR output PCB can be removed next. There is nothing more than two XLR sockets and a tiny PCB with the same set of elements as on the main XLR output board. Great! The next PCB which I am going to remove is XLR in remote I.O. board. Cables are going to be unplugged first, as usual. This one is in charge of IR flusher and remote control in and out. Additionally shielded ribbon cable uh, brings digital signal to and from coaxial and optical connectors, as well as RS-232 and 12 volt DC triggers. The last cable is for an analog audio signal to travel from XLR inputs. Now all 8 screws and RS-232 connector fixings can be undone and PCB itself extracted. As its name suggests, uh, this PCB accommodates three different functions. It's an XLR input, remote control and digital input. XLR input section brought me a bit of disappointment. Because balanced audio signal gets converted by GRC operational amplifiers and reaches analog to digital converters as unbalanced. Again, it's not perfect, but it's still way more advanced connection than regular RCA. For me personally, it's really important to have balanced input on board because I'm planning to use fully balanced phono stage for my turntable, which is located about 8 meters away from the preamplifier. XLR connection is a necessity for such a long cable run. Alright, it's time to remove the rear panel. Wi Fi and Bluetooth antenna extensions are going to be disconnected first. I will fix them in place with some LX tape to stop them rattling around. Next I will undo 10 screws which are securing HDMI sockets. And another 18 screws to undo which are keeping RCA sockets in place. Last two screws securing rear panel to the inner bracket are removed and the panel is separated. Digital PCB are going to be extracted next. I will remove the side connect PCB which links digital and DAC boards using this very handy prying tool from my iFixit toolkit. Ribbon cable between digital and DAC PCBs is unplugged and insulated. Another ribbon cable, the one situated between digital PCB and audio video unit, is also disconnected. 
two screws securing digital PCB to the inner bracket are undone. Last thing that is still attached is a side connector PCB linking all of three boards. With the help of my prying tool, last connector is successfully detached. Here we are. This is the digital PCB. This digital board is what adds letter A to the name of this AV preamplifier. Rest of the components are mostly identical between two models. Alright, let's take a closer look at this PCB. I will start with the main CPU. This is Runasis 120MHz 32-bit microcontroller. Curious fact, this microcontroller was not only used in the previous model, but in AV7705 as well. But I wouldn't be worried about it, as this component implements only control functions of this unit. It does not affect the sound. These two Panasonic chips are HDMI switchers, and I'm pretty sure that the third one, the one with 8K support, is hiding under this black heatsink. This heatsink is not designed to be removed very easily, so I have decided not to take a risk and left it untouched. An additional PCB which is sitting on top of the digital board is a network module. All the data from USB, Ethernet and wireless network is passing through this module. It is fixed with uh, four screws only, so I can remove it easily. This module is an off-the-shelf component made by Arcadian Technology Corporation. As the network module has been removed, I can now see a chip made by analog devices that's sitting under it. The ADV7850 is a high-quality, single-chip, multi-format video decoder, graphic digitalizer with an internal 4 to 1 multiplexed HDMI receiver. And that's not the only chip made by analog devices. You can also see two ADSP 21573 chips. They are digital sound processors and there is a massive amount of information about them. I will leave the link in the description if you are interested. The last analog devices chip on this board is the ADV8003. ADV8003 is a multiple input video signal processor that can deinterlace and scale standard definition, extended definition or high definition video data to HD formats. It can generate a bitmap on screen display as well as output the video with OSD overlay on two high definition multimedia interface transmitters and a video encoder. In the close proximity of each DSP you can see a SD-RAM chip. SD-RAM chip can also be found right next to the ADV8003 multiple input video signal processor. These two Altera Max 2 and Altera Max 5 chips are the complex programmable logic devices or just CPLDs. One of the smallest but very important chips is this PCM9211 216 kHz digital audio interface transceiver with stereo analog to digital converter and routing. It does not only handle the digital audio signal coming from coaxial and optical connectors, but it also converts audio signal which is routed from any of the analog inputs, including phono and XLR, into digital. I was wondering what this 13-pin shielded ribbon cable is, and I came to the conclusion that this was just an extension slash bypass for the HDMI AUX1 input which is located on the front of the unit. The thing is that in AV8805 that inner HDMI socket was located in the top left corner of the board, but now that area is occupied by that black heatsink which is cooling the 8K HDMI switcher. This way Moran's engineers relocated that socket to the bottom of the board. Not the most elegant solution. On the flip side of the board, the first thing that catches your eye is the shield plate that covers the bottom side of the area where DSP chips are located. 
Now it's time to extract the DAC PCB. I was surprised when I discovered that DAC PCB was only held in place by the side connect boards. But I believe that Moran's engineers know what they are doing and it's enough to keep DAC PCB in place. These side PCB connectors are actually quite solid and didn't want to give up very easily, but I managed to disconnect them after all. Oh, and I've almost missed the tiny power link between this PCB and audio video unit. Here we are, this is the digital to analog converter PCB. What makes this PCB stand out from the other DAC boards which I showed in my previous videos is that it has 8 discrete DAC chips on board. SR7500 and AV7705 had all-in-one DAC chips. You can see 8 two-channel ES9010K2M digital to analog converters. These DA converters are made by a California-based company called ESS Technology Incorporated. The ES9010K2M is a high-performance 32-bit stereo DA converter targeted for consumer applications as well as professional use. The HyperStream architecture can handle up to 32-bit 384 kHz PCM data as well as 11.2 MHz direct stream digital. If my information is correct, Morans used different DA converters inside AV8805 and AV8805A. I believe that they used AKM AK4490EQ inside the previous model. After balanced audio signal leaves DAC, it's boosted by NGM8068 dual operational amplifier. The NGM8068 is a low noise bipolar input audio operational amplifier. This op amp features low distortion, high slew rate, wide bandwidth and high open loop gain. NGM8080 operational amplifiers were used in previous model. Also, on this board you can see three PCM5100 stereo ducts with 32-bit, 384 kHz PCM interface, 100 dB signal-to-noise ratio and 100 dB dynamic range. First of these ducts are for the network module and the next two are for Zone 2 and Zone 3 respectively. And the last chip on this board, which I wanted to mention, is this Texas instrument PCM1803A two channel analog to digital converter with 24 bit and 98 kHz resolution and 103 dB signal to noise ratio and 103 dB dynamic range. It converts an audio signal which is routed from inner analog audio sources. This is the third component that I discovered that Marantz has changed in this model. AK5358BET was used inside AV8805. On the flip side of DAC PCB, you can also see the shield plate, which is covering the part of the board that is located right above the analog video section of the AV unit. Alright, it's time to move on and clear the audio-video unit of the remaining parts. Last three screws are undone and PCB can be separated from the bracket. With the use of my wonder prying tool, the last connect PCBs are also removed. Finally, I can take a closer look at the last remaining PCB. This is the audio-video PCB, which accommodates huge number of analog audio-video inputs and outputs. I don't understand why Morantz keeps putting so many of them while other manufacturers stopped doing that. At least they could get rid of analog video inputs and outputs and use that space and budget on something more useful. Talking about analog video. You can see the AVDM2000 analog video selector chip in the top left corner. As its name suggests, uh, it switches the signal between analog video inputs and outputs. In the middle part of this PCB you can see an array of relays, exactly same relays as on the XLR output PCB. 
This release can disable or enable RCA outputs when it's needed. 9. JRC Low Noise Bipolar Input Dual Operational Amplifiers can also be observed on this board. These op amps are widely used by Morans in this unit, including front PCB, XLR input and phono PCBs. Here in the top right corner you can see three chips which are 2 channel, 7 input, 3 output, analog switches. They are routing signal from analog audio inputs into main ATC as well as zone 2 and zone 3 outputs. These two are 8 channel electronic volume control chips. They are adjusting the gain of an audio signal which later reaches the HDAM modules. I believe that this is a bottleneck and it's the reason why this AV preamplifier is not fully balanced. You literally need to double the amount of volume control chips and some audio switches as well as PCB tracks and interconnecting cables to make this unit fully balanced. It probably wouldn't be too hard to achieve if you would get rid of analog AV inputs and outputs which are not really necessary. Here you can see another two 7 input, 3 output along with two for input for output dual analog switches. And last two chips which I'd like to mention are these two, two channel electronic volume control with input selector and tone control which are dedicated for zone 2 and zone 3 accordingly. In my opinion this PCB could have been redesigned a bit as it's very unlikely that you would use all these analog connectors in 2021. And making this AV preamplifier fully balanced would have been a huge improvement. This is it. To conclude, I'd like to add that I was very pleased with the build quality of this unit. It's made in Japan after all. In regards to repairability and easy access to the components, everything is great except the back panel ASI. It was quite tricky to get those components out and the amount of various interlinking cables wasn't helping. I was pleased to see lots of additional shields and partitions inside this unit. That's the first Marantz model where I saw so many of them. If I would compare AV7705 and this AV8805A AV preamplifier, I would say that AV7705 is more intuitive. It was harder to understand the logic of the design of AV8805A, but that wasn't something critical. I loved the discrete DAX and HDAM section, but I really missed a fully balanced design. And I will say that again, that Marantz should stop putting so many analog inputs inside their AV preamplifiers and receivers. In my personal setup I will utilize mainly HDMI inputs and XLR input which I will use to connect my turntable. That's it, I don't need another 7.1 and 6 stereo analog inputs. So these were my first impressions of AV8805A. I was really busy putting this video together and I didn't have time to properly calibrate this unit as well as appreciate the way it sounds. I can't wait to be able to fully enjoy the sound of Moran's AV8805A. I will definitely share my experience with you. So this is it for this video, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you soon, goodbye!